No, this is not another joke. We are finally reviewing Sonos. That's right. We bought the Beam Gen 2, so let's get into it. The Sonos Beam, now in its second generation, is the brand's smallest all-inclusive soundbar featuring Dolby Atmos, and it has five drivers, each driven by their own Class D amplifier. The Beam utilizes three passive radiators to help give this small bar a more full-range sound without the need for a separate subwoofer. But while the Beam is designed to be an all-in-one solution, it is also designed to be expanded upon to include a dedicated Sonos wireless subwoofer and surrounds should you want to go that route, though both are optional extras, which we'll go over in a bit. Now, in terms of connection options, there aren't many. The Beam has a single HDMI port that supports ARC and EARC. Clearly, the Beam Gen 2 supports Dolby Atmos signals, though it does not have DTS-X support. Now, the website claims DTS surround compatibility, though if you read the fine print, Sonos is careful to say that DTS support is, quote, not an indication of a licensed decoder. That's weird. The HDMI port also can be adapted using the included optical to HDMI cable, which allows the beam to work with older displays that may not have ARC or EARC through HDMI capability. You also get ethernet connectivity, which allows for streaming, but the beam isn't limited to just physical connections, for it has support for Wi-Fi, AirPlay 2, but strangely, no Bluetooth. Also absent is a physical remote control, though you can control the beam via its touch sensitive controls located along the top of the bar itself. You also have some measure of voice control thanks to support for Alexa and Google Assistant, but mainly you're gonna have to rely on the free Sonos app, which allows you to adjust the bar's tone, dialogue and night modes, not to mention run its auto EQ program, TruePlay. Setting up the Beam for the first time is pretty straightforward. While perhaps not quite as plug and play as the LG Eclair, it's not that far off with respect to simplicity. Once connected to the app, you will get full control over the Beam and the ability to tailor it to your listening space, which is an important step to get the best sound out of this particular soundbar. While TruePlay doesn't completely alter the sound of the Beam, it does help with respect to intelligibility and overall clarity, not to mention spatial quality. Now, TruePlay and the Sonos app are going to commandeer your phone's microphone in order to take measurements of the Beam in your room. but. Before you guys freak out and start looking for Big Brother, know that you can grant the Sonos app temporary access to your microphone in your phone in order to complete this step and then just turn it off when you're done. I recommend doing this because if you want to give Beam voice commands, either through Alexa or Google, the speaker itself has a microphone for that. And let's talk about the Sonos app for a second. For starters, it's pretty great. Clearly, Sonos has taken a page from Apple in creating an app that is very polished and relatively easy to use. And speaking of Apple, I was rather shocked to find native support for Apple Music. While it's not hard to find third-party app with support for Spotify, Tidal, or even Amazon Music, the Sonos app is the first that I am aware of with support for Apple Music, which for me, it's a pretty big plus. While I understand you can control the bar via its touch controls or somewhat through your voice, truth be told, I tried these methods just to say that I did, but ultimately I relied on the app more. I found that after about 20 minutes of use, the app was pretty much second nature. All right, so enough about the nitty gritty inputs and outputs and all that. How does the Beam Gen 2 sound? And does it live up to the hype? And was it worth the wait? Well. After having our review requests go unanswered for over a year, the entire time you guys talking Sonos up, I will admit my expectations were pretty darn high. So was the Beam 2 worth our money? Yeah, the Beam is rather special. I was genuinely surprised by its sound quality and I'm happy to report that the Beam is the real deal. And in many ways, it may be the sub thousand dollar soundbar to beat, but allow me to break it down. First and foremost, the Beam, unlike a lot of other soundbars, does not come with a wireless subwoofer. If you need more bass, Sonos charges extra for that in the form of their Sub Gen 3, which will set you back an additional $749. That said, in a bedroom or small room setup, I do not believe the Beam needs a sub in order to sound full range, or at least fulfilling in the bass department. To say that the bass response of the Beam is satisfying, even impressive, would be one of the bigger understatements regarding this soundbar.
While the Beam didn't play as deep as the comparably priced LG Eclair, which does have a wireless sum, the Sonos sound was richer and more textural through the bass and low mid bass that I was okay giving up some extension for greater low end clarity and composure while also keeping the extra $800 in my pocket. I did not test the Beam with the Sonos sub, so I have no idea how or if it helps or potentially hinders the Beam's performance. Suffice to say, even out in our main room, the Beam served up enough bass to make action films like Six Underground, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and Peacemaker fun and captivating. Now the mid-range is arguably the Beam's greatest strength. A lot of bars come across as lean or cool in this department thanks to them having to rely a bit too much on a dedicated subwoofer for any appreciable weight. Not so with the Beam. It has an almost monitor-like sound to its mid-range, at least with respect to tonality. We'll get into separation and whatnot in just a minute. Vocals sounded more true to life and organic through the Beam compared to other similarly sized soundbars. The Sonos strives for neutrality and as a result gets very, very close to achieving it, at least in the mid-range. I would put the Beam's mid-range performance up there with the Bang & Olufsen Bio Sound Stage or even the Ambio. I'm not saying it's equal to these two costlier soundbars, but it's up there. Both music and movies sounded more right, dare I say traditional, because the mildly larger drivers found within the Beam are simply capable of reproducing more of the frequency range on their own compared to other soundbars, and this is something that is immediately noticeable. Which brings me to the tweeter, yes, the tweeter, because the Beam has only one. Its presence is definitely heard, for it is more center-focused and pronounced as a result. While the highs are not bad, sharp, or brittle, quite the opposite actually, the center-mounted tweeter does make the Beam's overall focus a bit more center-weighted compared to other bars, even compared to the diminutive LG Eclair. But like the bar's mid-range, the tweeter is simply more organic, more naturally airy, and above all, just more composed compared to much of the competition, though if absolute intelligibility is important. I wouldn't be surprised if some listeners turn the treble control up a notch or two in order to make the beam brighter overall on account of it having but one tweeter. Now, with respect to soundstage, or should I say surround sound, in my experience and in our room, the beam is spacious, but it's also very appropriately named. Laterally and even depth-wise, the Sonos is impressive, but its surround sound performance is most impressive when the bar is in relative alignment with your seated listening position. The Beam lacks upward firing drivers, and as a result, its vertical dispersion is just not quite as good as some bars with these drivers. Don't get me wrong, the Beam isn't terrible when playing back at most content. It's way better than the LG Eclair we just reviewed, but in terms of floor to ceiling dispersion and spaciousness, it just didn't mop the floor with the competition. Dynamically, the beam is impressive, though I will say it is at its best when kept below 80 dB or so, where it is virtually unflappable, even in a space as large as ours. Go above 80 dB and some compression, clipping, or distortion will begin to set in, and its otherwise composed and spacious sound will flatten and, well, beam. As a result, dynamics will start to compress and be more shouty rather than engaging. But like I said, keep it at or around 80 dB and I doubt the beam will give anyone much, if anything, to complain about with respect to dynamics. So what's wrong with it? Well, a lot of you like to say that with respect to value for money, nothing beats the beam. While that is accurate in many respects, it's not outright true in everyone. For starters, soundbars with separate subwoofers may play lower or have more bass than the Beam on its own. Now, while you can add a Sonos sub to the Beam, doing so raises the cost to almost 1200 bucks, which is approaching Samsung Q950A territory, which for that price, I say get the Sammy because you also get a subwoofer, surrounds, and upward firing drivers. And while the Beam does support Atmos, it relies very heavily on Dolby virtualization to give you a surround sound effect. It's very good in this respect, arguably better than any bar at or around 500 bucks, but it isn't perfect and does suffer from a lack of dispersion with respect to height. 
As a result, sound may at times be a little more localized to the bar itself compared to the competition. I recommend placing the beam as close to the bottom edge of your display as possible to ensure that some sounds, chiefly dialogue, sound as if they are emanating from the center of your TV rather than from the beam itself. Then of course, there is the lack of DTS-X support, which for some of you may or may not be a deal breaker. Lastly, the lack of additional inputs and no support for Bluetooth may be problematic for some. While I was surprised by the Beam single HDMI port, after thinking about it, I, I think I understand because I believe the Beam is meant to be as simple and as easy to use as possible, and additional ports may have confused or complicated matters for first-time users. That said, no Bluetooth? That's the head-scratcher. So how does the Beam stack up to the likes of LG, Samsung, and more? Well, compared to the tiny LG Eclair, both systems have their strengths and their weaknesses. For me, the Eclair is a little more versatile in that the LG allows you to dial in its sound to taste, more so than what Sonos allows. That said, I was never able to achieve as neutral a tone or tonal balance through the Eclair as what the Beam simply possesses on its own straight out of the box. The Eclair always maintained a more punchy, smile-like response compared to the Beam's more linear, balanced sound overall. At times, the slightly leaner, more treble forward sound of the Eclair was welcomed for dialogue intelligibility, but on the whole, the Beam is a more mature and refined sound in comparison. Though, if you like bass and you need a bit of thump in your life, the Eclair does play deeper thanks to its included subwoofer. Compared to the Bose 900 soundbar, this is a little bit more of a fair fight. The Bose is almost twice the price of the Beam, though the two bars, at least in their white finish, look like relative twins. I prefer the Beam, it sounds fuller, richer, and more neutral compared to the Bose, though the Bose is better spatially, at least with respect to height and the sensation of experiencing sounds happening overhead. I would still buy the Samsung Q950A over the Beam. While a Beam with the Sonos Sub and surrounds is about the same price as the Samsung, the Q950A simply has more to offer for the money by way of features, connectivity, and even sound quality. But, the Samsung system doesn't look as good as the Sonos products, nor is its app anywhere near as good. And as for my two reference all-in-one solutions, the Ambio and Biosound Stage, I would still buy both of these over the Beam as they are the better option, but they're also nearly five times the price, so they better be. While I continue to be impressed by the BNO and Sennheiser bars, the fact that the Beam can even be mentioned in the same conversation as these costlier options makes the Sonos especially impressive for the money. So the only question that likely remains for all of you is this. Seeing as how we bought the Sonos Beam Gen 2 with our own money and at full retail, are we sending it back? Did we just do this to buy and return it in order to silence a few critics? Well, it sure started out that way, but that's not how this story is ending, for I am happy enough with the Beam's performance that we're keeping it. Say hello to our new sub $1,000 reference soundbar. So that's it. That is now my review of the Sonos Beam Gen 2. But now it's time to find out if Christy liked it. Well, now I know that this was your first Sonos experience. This was actually my second. Really? Yeah. Well, the hair salon that I go to, mm -hmm. they have, I think it might be the one. Oh, yeah. The little, it's, it's yeah. A, or they, you know, it's the bigger, it's the bigger unit, like single speaker. Or yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I always thought that the sound there was pretty impressive, especially considering the place that I get my hair done is basically a concrete box. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't expect too many surprises when it came to this re review, but I'm not going to lie. When we finally got the beam in the house and plugged it in, I was not impressed. In fact, I thought it sucked. Really? Yes. And wow. this is where I feel like our, you know, quote reviews um, are going to be a bit different. All Not right. that I don't think we ultimately come up with the same end opinion, mm -hmm. but for me, lay it on me. And this is where we, you know, kind of veer off course from each other. Mm -hmm. The sound out of the box, again, to me, mm -hmm. I thought was anemic and frankly unimpressive. Tell yeah. me how you really feel. I did, I hated it. Really? Yeah, it was terrible. Really? I was like, what the hell? Really? Y yeah. Okay. Yeah. And All then, right. and All then, right. and then. And then the fun wasn't over. When the bar kept muting and unmuting itself, I honestly, I was like, what is all the fuss about? Turns out <laughs> that was an internet connectivity issue. Yes. Meaning we didn't have any. Yeah. <laughs> and, but once the internet came back on, that issue finally resolved itself. Yes. 
but it did be, it did prove to be problematic in the moment, especially mm-hmm. considering that the the beam does not come with you know a, its own remote. Yeah, I mean Sonos is definitely banking on you using the app, and this is where not to take anything away from your criticism, but this is where when we're initially setting up a a product. Christy is not often a part of that process. And so everything she said is completely true. However, uh, like most modern components, at least those that are connected to Wi-Fi or whatever, uh, the Beam required some a firmware update out of the box. So yes, we did actually hear the Beam uh, during spotty internet here in Austin. And we also heard the Beam pre-firmware update. Now the firmware update did not change the sound of the Beam at all but it did help fix that start-stop connectivity thing. Okay, right. So now about about the sound. Like okay. I said, initially, I was not a fan. That was until you ran the room correction. Okay. And talk about a game-changing moment. And you <laughs> could have told me that you plugged in a different sound bar and I would have believed you. Okay. Night and day difference for me. Hmm. Too long, you have, you're not listening anymore. The beam is good. Yeah. Okay, it's really good. Now, for... Something that um, I think is important to talk about is dialogue clarity. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you made a point to showcase the dialogue enhancement for me, and you were asking me to do it, you know, what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, Mm -hmm. I, I really couldn't tell the difference whether it was on or off. Yeah. But I found that the enhancement really wasn't needed. So that to me wasn't a big deal. I, I thought that it had really, really good dialogue clarity. I never felt like I struggled to hear what people were saying. Yeah, I will say, um, I will say about the beam, there is a, it's not called dialogue mode, but there is a dialogue enhancement feature within the app. A lot of soundbars have this. The beam is by far, Sonos' uh, implementation of it is by far the least aggressive or more, most subtle uh, version of this type of technology that I have heard in a soundbar to date. So toggling it on and off won't really produce grand demonstrable changes. That said, uh, my pro tip to some of you, if you are considering the beam and dialogue intelligibility is of the utmost importance. I wouldn't really fuss with the dialogue enhancement feature. I would just take the treble slider in the app's tone controls and just bump that up plus one or plus two. It actually sounds a little bit more natural. It brings out a little bit added intelligibility. Um, and that's really all you need to do which is what I did for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I thought it was work. It was yeah, great. Yeah, it, it, it does. It works. But when you asked me, like, you were doing, like, kind of the on and off thing, yeah. I was like, yeah. I don't. I know you said you thought you could tell a, a slight difference, but for yeah. me, there wasn't any. Uh, now, I know we just reviewed the LG Eclair, mm-hmm. and f- to me, I think the LG does give you deeper bass, which yeah. makes it really fun when you're watching movies. Yeah. Now, that deep, deep rumbling bass isn't something that I personally require Mm -hmm. because if you've, you know, listened to me ramble (laughs) before, you know, I prefer my bass to be on the swifter side. Yeah. Uh, So for me, you know, I'm okay with the bass that you get from the beam. Mm -hmm. Um, Plus, you know, the screechy noises that occurred while watching Netflix (laughs) using the Eclair were thankfully not found on the beam. So bonus there. Yeah. Um, Overall, I like the design of the beam better than the Eclair. Mm -hmm. And I I honestly prefer not having to deal with subwoofer placement in the bedroom, which is where we're going to be using it. Mm -hmm. But if I absolutely needed a subwoofer, I would get something else like the Eclair. Why? Why would you? I'm about about to tell you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Now, if you're, if you're Andrew, Because I can see your wheels spinning. (laughs) If you're wondering why, well, why not just add the Sonos subwoofer? Yeah. There is no way in hell that I am paying $800 for that donut-shaped sub. (laughs) It's not happening. Sorry. Like you said, at that point, Mm -hmm. we are talking about spending real money, and mine would be going somewhere else, like the Samsung. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I... It's not that I think that the Sonos sub, again, I have not heard it. So this is purely based on what I can read on the internet. Um, it's not that I think the Sonos sub is necessarily a bad value. So long as it sounds good and performs kind of how they are advertising it to perform, 
seven hundred and some odd dollars for a subwoofer isn't necessarily bad. There are subwoofers that cost way more than that. That said, it's not like you're going to spend seven hundred dollars and have a subwoofer maybe for life. It is very much for the Sonos system. You can't go and add whatever sub you want to the Beam either and save money that way. So the Beam, like Bose, kind of um, traps you a little bit into an ecosystem, which may or may not be something that you guys want to partake in. Um, in a bedroom or small room, I'm totally fine with the Beam by itself. I don't think that the subwoofer is necessary, but if I was relying on a Sonos uh, system as my main theater experience, maybe even in a moderate to large size room, I would get the sub reluctantly if I knew I wanted to be in the Sonos ecosystem because maybe I had other Sonos speakers throughout the entire house. But if that wasn't the case, I'm with you. I would totally get the Samsung or another bar uh, because you're just getting a lot more for your money at that point. My thoughts exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's – but I, I do really like it. I'm, yeah. I overall, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really enjoy – the beam and mm -hmm. i think it's it's a it's good yeah. it's good they it it deserves or sonos i guess deserves a lot of the accolades that mm -hmm. it you know that they that you you know hear and read about yeah anything else well i mean the only thing that i feel like people may have questions about is how this compares to what i would have called our prior sub $1,000 soundbar recommendation, mm -hmm. um, which has for the longest time been the Clips Cinema 600. Oh. And you didn't mention that. And so I think, uh, I think people might have questions. Well, the Cinema 600, uh, because it has that massive included subwoofer, will fill a large space just as easily as it will fill a small one. Um, the Klipsch is going to be more dynamic. It's going to be just much bigger sounding. Um, and I know that the 600 system is relatively the same price as the Beam on its own. Uh, um, it's a little bit more expensive. Maybe just a little bit. It depends but, if you catch it on sale. Oh, yeah. But okay. at retail, I think it's yeah. around 600 Yeah. Um, look, that subwoofer with the Cinema 600 system is massive. So if you are tight on space, I would totally understand why... You would just be like, I, I see the value in the 600, but I just, I don't see a home for it. Totally get it. Um, I think the Beam is nicer looking. It's definitely a more sophisticated ownership experience. Um, the Beam is very much Tesla, whereas, you know, Klipsch is Harley Davidson It's or Ford. It's just, you know, rugged and tough. It's Klipsch. It's Klipsch. Um, and then nothing against that. I, I, I like them both. If I was going for absolute cinematic quality in a soundbar system under a grand, the Cinema 600 would still be on my list. Especially that, for a larger space. Especially for say. a larger space. But um, in, ter in terms of total user experience, ease of use, customization. Yeah, because I, I still don't think they've got the, the app. Dialed in just yet, yeah. yeah. The Sonos is just a more complete package, and it's, it's, it's just more refined. Um, yeah, uh, you know, nothing against nothing against the clips. I still like it. If you bought one, you still bought really well, and I will continue to recommend the Cinema 600 because it is that good. Um, but if you're willing to maybe spend a little bit less, but also get less because you don't get a subwoofer, but you want a better, more refined, more thought out user experience, the Sonos Beam all day. Okay, that was it. That was it. All right. So that is now our review of the Sonos Beam Gen 2. What you guys think? Let us know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, my question of the day for you is this. Was our Sonos review worth the wait? And why is the answer to that question? Obviously, yes. Sound off. <laughs> I just answered it for you. Anyway, uh, if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Go ahead and ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy left for you down below, know that that is a great way that you've continued to show your support for this channel and the work that we do here. And we both thank you all very much for doing that. Follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audio File. And that is it for us today. We did it, guys. We reviewed Sonos. Took a little longer than we thought but we've finally done it. So let's just end it.
Let's just end it. The only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video.